These were published in 1851. These deserve to rank with Jefferson on Virginia and the writings of Woodrow Wilson. Continuing down, we're two pages on now, page 315. So Calhoun argued that the political war against the South and slavery was being fought mainly by powerful lobbies rather than by the democratic wish of the people. He detected very, very early on the threat to American democracy represented by the lobby system already growing. Thanks to the slaves he and his wife owned, he could pursue a public career, first in Charleston, then in Washington, of completely disinterested public service. Uh, exactly the same argument had been used in defense of slavery in 5th century B.C. Athens. Exactly the same argument. Come, come uh, 2,300 years and I've gotten nowhere. Now this defense was self-contradictory. So we're going to, here's a little passage. This guy is traveling in the south. And uh, this anecdote, here's this anecdote, absorb it as you will. Quote, in the north, every young man has to scrabble rapaciously to make his fortune. But in the south, the handing down of slave plantations from father to son breeds gentlemen who put honor before profit and are always jealous of their own and are the natural friends of public liberty. So in other words, the patrician class, people who are devoid of, of worries in the real world. If you're, if you're all caught up in the real world and materialism and stuff, you can't really cultivate the mind, the spirit. This is Platonism. This is Platonism. But there it is. Uh, the speaker, an educated man from South Carolina College, cited Calhoun as an example of what he meant. Like I said, Calhoun was a patrician of the new world. Now, skipping down a page. We come here to the key mechanism in the political battle over slavery the need of the South to extend it state by state in order to preserve its share in the power balance of Congress. Uh, the South felt that it could not sit still and fight a defensive battle to preserve slavery because the population of the North was rising much faster and non-slave states were being added all the time. Once the non-slave states controlled not just the House but the Senate too, they could change the Constitution. Now, remember the Senate has uh, two senators for every state no matter how big it is. Now they already controlled Congress, the North did, this, the anti-slavery feeling. Already controlled Congress. But in the Senate there was this precarious balance that had been maintained. They had gotten control of Congress because of population, but in strict numbers state per state there was a tie. And so the South looked at it like things are changing in the future we are they are going to change the Constitution and outlaw our way of life, so we're going to have to defend this at some time. So hostility was seen, uh, not hostility as in shooting and killing, but hostility in the sense of uh, what might come to shooting and killing, was seen a long way off. So the South had to be aggressive, and it was that which eventually led to the Civil War. Great, so we have another cause for the Civil War on the table. The South had to be aggressive in defending itself against the North, which was growing faster. Also, um, the Mexican-American War uh, caused the tension which led to the Civil War over who's going to settle these new uh, properties. Is it going to be slaves or non-slaveholders? It was now on page 319. Um, to him, if the Union could be preserved only at the price of retaining slavery, it were better it should end, especially since, in the breakup, slavery itself would perish. This is John Adams, who we're getting from right now. Um, he says, quote, If slavery be the destined sword in the hands of the destroying angel, which is to sever the ties of this union. So they saw a catastrophe looming over this subject way before it became so entrenched and ingrained. So continuing there, destroying angel, which is to sever the ties of this union. The same sword will cut asunder the bonds of slavery itself. A dissolution of the union for the cause of slavery would be followed by a servile war in the slaveholding states. It certainly would. The slaves would revolt. They simply would. Combined with a war between the two severed portions of the union, the North would have to invade if it, if, it, if it believes that it's going to let half the country go because it's so detested by slavery, then it would invade to stop slavery. It would say, okay, you can't have those slaves. We're going to set them free. Nine million people in the South, uh, nine million whites, pardon me, and four million slaves. 
That is an enormous captive population held in servile conditions that are really disgusting. And, um, and, and the, the North wouldn't have had it. So as he says, even if these two portions were severed, uh, there would be a war between them. Its result must be the expiration of slavery from the whole continent and calamitous and devastating as the course of events must be, so glorious would be the final issue that as God should judge me, I dare not say it is not to be desired. Now, can, how can we have that sort of, of fervor and zest uh, coming from out of our past speaking to us? It was speaking to those people right up to the minute of the, the uh, Civil War. So people were talking about this. This was in people's minds for generations before the war started. The idea that it, it, would, it could and might possibly would destroy the Union. And then after that, what would happen? Look at all this stuff. It's a very, very uncanny insight that he had. Continuing, though, with high-placed statesmen talking in the exalted and irreconcilable terms that Adams and, to a lesser extent, Calhoun employed, it is a wonder that the United States did not indeed break up in the 1820s. Now let's stop for a moment of reflection on what I was, what was for me the impetus of this project. The reason that I got into this project, the reason I started investigating this, was because the libertarians attack Lincoln. In all honesty, the Civil War used to be quite boring to me. The more I learned about America's history and the more I learned about the 1800s itself, the more exciting it is. But when I was in, uh, in grade school, 1800s, American history itself in the 1800s was the most boring thing I could imagine. Now, Adams says, to him, if the Union could be, pres be preserved only the price of retaining slavery, it would be better it should end. In other words, in other words let's let go of that part of the country if we have to. But then what would happen? And he gives this analysis of what would happen. There would be a revolt in that part of the country. Uh, the North would invade that part of the country. And what if we did just let parts of the country secede? What if that was a precedent? At what point do you say, no, we're taking a stand right now. This means war. If you try to take land away from the sovereign area of our Constitution, we will try to kill you. You cannot take land away from our constitutional area. Um, that has to mean war. There, how, there, however, is a, a, the larger question of slavery, which is, I mean, a, uh, so Abraham Lincoln, maybe, if slavery weren't in the question, maybe, maybe, it would be possible for him to say, okay, war is too costly, the South, we're just going to have to let it go. But slavery was in the question. So, so then there's definitely no way that you can morally just let them secede. Okay. We have a constitutional structure, democracy, the first self-ruling people in history. And we're going to let a bunch of slaveholders carve half of the nation off the South and just take it. And we're not going to do anything. Come on. That's not credible. But that's what the libertarians uh, hold. That's I, gu I guess that's the, the base of their hatred of Hinkland, Lincoln. Now, now um, you uh, list, just go listen to De Lorenzo and read his book, I'm sure, on Lincoln, which I haven't read. Uh, the Real Lincoln, I think it's called. But uh, of his speeches, if his speeches indicate anything at all in his books, then they, he does not make a convincing case that Lincoln did a bad thing. So it's interesting, the analysis we can put to that is that Adams would let the Union break apart because he didn't want slavery in it. Tom DeLorenzo would let slavery exist because he detests the idea of holding the Union together. Hmm, I don't know if we can do that. But I'll tell you what. So far from the attitude of modern libertarians who would end the Union and let slavery continue to exist, they say, they say not only 